Uh, our first skip, uh, speaker uh, is Maxim D. Schreier. He is a professor of Russian, English, and Jewish studies at Boston College, and the author of 15 books in English and Russian, among them, Living Russia, a Jewish Story, Voices of Jewish Russian Literature, Yom Kippur of Amsterdam, and most recently, Of Politics and Pandemics, Songs of a Russian Immigrant. Uh, and in brackets, uh, I just can say that it seems to me introducing Maxim Schreier is anyway superfluous because he's so central to the fields of the Russian, to the field of the Russian Jewish studies that, uh, uh, but anyway, this was the introduction, Maxim, please. Maxim? Yes, I'm here. I'm just sharing the screen. Oh, Bear with sorry. it. And it's going to take a second. All right. So, shalom, good afternoon. Dobry den. Can you all hear me? Can you see the pictures? Yes? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Yeah. It's a real pleasure to be here to see so many friends and colleagues. Uh, the title of my talk is Paths of the Russian Avant Garde Poetry in Israel. On the title slide, on your left, you see the title page of Mikhail Grobman's collection, Military Notebooks from 1992, autographed to yours truly. And on your right, a hand-drawn title page of Ilya Bakstein's collection, Glints of the Wave from 1986, espousing very different styles and poetics. Both Grobman and Bakstein gravitate to visual images of wondrous monsters so as to signal the avant-gardism of their verses. And just, to, uh, I guess, to amuse uh, myself and all of you, I placed in the middle this beautiful drawing by Valentina Krupivnitskaya, a major artist in her own right and the wife of um, Askar Rabin, a prominent figure of the second Russian avant-garde who emigrated to France in 1978. In a sense, the title slide is meant to underscore tentatively the idea of avant-garde Russian poetry in Israel as part of the larger transnational Russian cultural avant-garde. For the purposes of this conversation, I propose to understand avant-garde poetry as poetic creation that is formally texturally or gesturally experimental, radical, or polemical vis-a-vis -vis the poetic mainstream that precedes or surrounds it, and also as poetic practice that may be accompanied or augmented by public acts of protest, challenge, or defiance on the part of the creators of avant-garde poetic texts. What is being protested, challenged, or defied can only be determined contextually, measured against the axes of national cultures, histories, and politics, and conceptualized through languages and styles employed in the practice of avant-garde creation. Allow me also to make four prefatory observations, actually make one observation, pose two questions, and then make another brief observation. The first observation is that Zionism and avant-garde poetry make strange bedfellows. While some fascinating research has been undertaken regarding the confluence of Zionist ideology and avant-garde arts and letters, notably, of course, Michael Stanislavski's work on Zionism and uh, von der Siekel, it does not translate easily or comfortably into a generalized approach going beyond the boundaries of time, place, and language culture. Specifically, the history of Russian language poetry yields major articulators and propagators of early Zionism, be it political or cultural. Think, for instance, of Samuel Marshak's early Zionist verse. Think even harder of Zhubatinsky's poetry. And yet, both Zhubatinsky of his Hesped in the memory of Herzl from 1904 and Marshak of his cycle Palestine from 1916 gravitate toward classical versification and a case for considering this exemplary Russian Zionist poetry as avant-garde by virtue of its articulate message or outlying context is difficult, very, very difficult to make. In this sense, such blazingly experimental Judeo-centric and one might add culturally Zionist poetry as what Valentin Parnach or Matvey Roisman were writing in the early 1920s Soviet Union are by and large exceptions and deserve more attention by the students of Jewish letters. Finally, I should probably mention in passing 
that modern Israeli poetry inherited a large dose of avant-gardism from the generation of Abraham Shlonsky, Natan Alterman, and Leah Goldberg, who had moved to the mandate from the former Russian Empire and who were, to think of uh, a term the formalists might deploy, nephews and nieces, or perhaps grandnephews and grandnieces of the Russian Silver Age. This backdrop for the understanding of the paths of the Russian avant garde in Israel is significant, although I will not be able to do it justice in these brief remarks. Now, to turn to the questions I will investigate in the main part of the talk. The first is, how do we examine Russian-Israeli avant-garde poetry against the backdrop of late Soviet poetry, third wave Russian immigrant poetry, fourth wave Russian immigrant poetry, and post-Soviet poetry? The second is, how do we measure the texture of Russian-Israeli avant-garde poetry within and without the Israeli context? to turn to the next two slides. In the first, you see two images, both from the 1970s. On the right, you see a refusenik protest outside the USSR Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow. Is it possible, is it not blasphemous to think of this refusenik protest as an act of heroic Zionist political avant-gardism? Think particularly of the slogan, visa to Israel instead of prisons. Visa to Israel instead of prisons. On the left, you see a bohemian crowd congregating outside the legendary Saigon Cafe, corner of Nevsky and Vladimirsky Prospect in Leningrad. There is hardly any overlap between the people participating in the refusing demonstration with the avant-garde protest slogan and the crowd hanging both outside and inside the officially tolerated gathering spot for nonconformist artists, poets, and their admirers. In the next slide, you see a line outside the Israeli consulate in Moscow. This is August 1990. And people from all walks of life mix and mingle here, all of them intent on getting out of the Soviet Union. This crowd is likely to include members of the artistic intelligentsia who were previously disinclined to emigrate and might have been given to private artistic pursuits, including those in the avant-garde unofficial circles. In the 1990s, largely due to the great influx of hundreds of thousands of Jews and their family members from the former USSR, one observes a major diversification and transformation of Russian-Israeli culture. And one of the features of this transformation is what one might call the simultaneous mainstreaming and side-streaming of Russian-Israeli avant-garde poetry in the 1990s. In the remaining time, I would like to feature the profiles of seven creative personae, Mikhail Grobman, Ilya Bakstein, Andriy Volokhonsky, Mikhail Gendilev, Galidana Zinger, Alexander Barash, and Anna Gorenka. Collectively, they represent three generations and two aliyahs. Their composite image tells a compelling story of Russian-Israeli avant-garde poetry from the early 1970s to the early 2000s, where I will reluctantly have to stop. So the first brief se segment is titled Mikhail Grobman in the direction of Tel Aviv conceptualism. Grobman, who was born in 1939 in Moscow and has been in Israel since 1971, was a prominent player on the nonconformist artistic scene in Moscow of the 1960s. In fact, he allegedly coined the term second avant-garde. Grobman is not only a visual artist, but a poet. While his visual art bears overt avant-garde formal qualities, Grobman's poetry is hardly experimental or texturally avant-garde. As a poet, he mainly clings to traditional classical versification and employs multiple ironies. His poetry brings to mind the work of the Leonozova circle, especially its master, Evgeny Krupovnitsky, also Jan Sutonovsky and Igor Holin, whose political subversiveness Grobman brings to Israel and deploys in his verses. Let's just briefly consider this beginning of the untitled poem, Prativne Gora Samari, which I will read in the English translation um, by the late Andrew von Hendy and, um, and myself. Uh, Samaria's hills are gross, you heard me. The clouds so grim, you wouldn't believe. Thus at Ovir, they all assured me, refused to let the damn fool leave. Why ruin, your, why ruin your career, you weasel? Major Petruk conveyed his doubt that that Zionism spreads like measles. Even back then, he'd figured out. Here and elsewhere, Grobman, the poet, 
develops a poetics that runs parallel to that of Moscow conceptualism, finding the most common ground, I believe, with Mitri Alexandrovich Prigov in the context of Russian Israeli literature. Could the message of this texturally plain poem, the message that subverts from within and from without both the, Zion, the Soviet anti Zionist rhetoric and the rhetorical justification of Aliyah, be considered an act of avant garde? avant-gardism. I leave you with the question and move to one of my personal favorites, the late Ilya Bakhstein, who was born in Moscow in 1937, made Aliyah in 1972, and died in Yafo in 1999. And this, this segment is called Ilya Bakhstein toward a Kabbalistic transcendence, a hermit by choice and by destiny, a true Budjitlianin of Russian-Israeli poetry, Bakhstein came to Israel with a poetic voice of his own, formed more or less in isolation and further forged during his gulag sentence for openly challenging the Soviet system to permit its poets what the constitution guaranteed every Soviet citizen. In Israel, Bakhstein produced a peerless body of verse originally published as an illuminated manuscript in the 1970s and 80s, Already, and that, I think, is already an act of avant-garde desperate freedom. Consider, I just want to show you what it looks like in its illuminated form, uh, and we will consider just the opening of this Afanta Yutoma, also known as Fantasia Judaica. Я еврей, ни мадонны рожден, ни к кресту пригвожден, и тоски мне не выразить всей цепи рода на мне, скорб народа во мне, я застыл у безмолвных дверей. Bachstein is one of the few post-war heirs to Chlebnikovian transcends, perhaps the only one in Russian-Israeli poetry in both of its principal dimensions, paranomastic verbal meaning beyond conventional usage and cosmological meaning beyond traditional cosmology. I will now turn to the third segment, Andriy Volokhonsky, Paths of Absurdist Lyric. Born in 1936 in Leningrad, Volokhonsky made Aliyah in 1973 and lived in Israel until 1985. He subsequently lived in Germany where he died in 2017. Different currents of absurdism nurtured his creativity from poets of the Abiriu circle, especially Zabalotsky's nature philosophical verses to Western modernists bent on absurdism, such as for instance, Christian Morgenstern. We shall briefly turn to the example from Volokhonsky's Galilee, a song, and read the two opening quatrains. Payuna flayti galilejski lutni, pra ozero pachoje na skripku, i v strunach golas druga ili ryby, da ozero pachoje na ptitsu, o ozero pachoje na citru, nad nebesami, gde letajet nebo, tam golubaj ryby ili ptitsa, na beregach moj drug, da nini nebo. Volokhonsky gave Russian Israeli literature a body of lyrics deeply rooted in place, Israel old and new, gently exploring the boundaries of Judaic and Christian literary identities and ecstatically celebrating Jewish poetics as a kind of tug of war game between harmonizing and disharmonizing messages about history. The fourth segment deals with Mikhail Gendelev, of whom we've heard a lot today from uh, Masha Abtiekman and from other contributors. So this will be very, very brief, but you cannot possibly omit this from the whole, from the whole story. Um, this segment is called uh, Mikhail Gendelev, A Journey Back to Futurism and Constructivism. Um, Gendelev, who was born in 1950 in Leningrad, came to Israel in 1977 at the peak of the first great Soviet exodus and passed away in Tel Aviv in 2009. Gendelev's work has received much critical attention. And uh, what I find particularly important in this context is the extent to which he fashioned and refashioned his public images. Uh, and yet, and yet, some of his most iconic public self-presentations invite a comparison with the poets of Russian futurism and constructivism. These two photos, look at them. In the one on the left, Gendelev so strikingly resembles Mayakovsky of around 1920-21, and in the one on the right, so tremendously resembles Ilya Selvinsky of the 1940s. It is just uncanny, and I don't think it's just the self-presentation. It's the verse itself. Uh, let's turn briefly to Biliard Vyafa, Billiards in Yafo. And uh, what I want to say here is that Gendelev's verses betray both 
and egocentrism of graphic arrangement. Perhaps it's a kind of special revision of the Mayakovskyan step ladder verse of Soviet poetry and a futurist and constructivism, constructivist centrality of the poetic utterance as the structural unit of meaning. If we can, so uh, let's just read the opening uh, section and then conduct a brief experiment. Был бинт горизонт на коем сукровица полоса, а день был как день покойник с видом на небеса, на акваторию сирого порта, сети и тех пустей. Мысль была о бессмертии того же сорта, что уловы сетей. Now, the experiment. As you can see, we have rearranged these verses into quatrains, and uh, the resulting form would further augment Gendelev's affinity, particularly in this case with the poetry of Ilya Silvinsky of the late 1920s and early 30s. Consider the two opening quatrains of, of the lay of Ulyalayev, Ulyalayevshina. Telegramma пришла в 2.10 ночи, ковровый тигр мерно зверел, когда турецких туфель подогреческий почер исчеркал его пустыню от стола до дверей, and so on and so forth. I think uh, the point uh, speaks for itself without further, uh, without further elaboration. Now, thinking of the longevity of Russian Soviet avant-garde poetic traditions and their transplantation onto the Israeli soil, we leave behind Gendelev and turn to this fifth segment devoted to Galidana Singe, who was born in 1962 in Leningrad and made Aliyah in 1988. And the segment is called Galidana Singe, Roads of Russian-Israeli Translingualism. Gali Danazinger, poet, visual artist, translator, publisher, larger than life cultural figure, is almost synonymous with what I earlier called the process of simultaneous mainstreaming and side streaming of Russian Israeli poetic avant garde. Likewise, Dvoyetochia, colon, its title referring to a punctuation sign, not to a part of the digestive tract, the magazine of experimental arts and letters that she publishes with her husband, the writer Nikoda Zinger, is a window onto both the Israeli and the international Russophone avant-garde. The aspect of uh, Galidana's uh, avant-garde poetics that interests me especially is her exploration of various possibilities of translingual texture of verse. And I don't just mean merely bilingual or multilingual, but that 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 lives and breathes betwixt and between, to borrow the from the starkly monolingual Robert Frost. So let's take the example of uh, this opening part into the muddle into the, the muzzle of death merd from part of who. Mordu smerti merd smerti fharu mavet hara hara mavet. Тоже мне хмата хари, поискадаш и скадал, и скадал весь скадаш, изгадил, китиш град с лица земли, изгладил морду смерти, как дашь, морду смерти, как дашь. So what I find very interesting here is uh, that both poles of paranomasia, if you think of Omri Ranan's theory, are at work here. The kind of explosive Klebnikovian one and the punsteristic Nabokovian one, both are at work. Of course, the lion in Hebrew, Chava Karamavet, which is a play on the Russian smerti v'charu, into the muzzle of death, could be translated as shit death or shit calmer death. Uh, notably, here, Singer writes Hebrew words and expressions in correct Russian transliteration, as though read from the right to the left, and as if they were Hebrew transliterations of invented Russian words and expressions, as though read from left to right. And I think, finally, Singer's translingual Hara Mavet is probably, I suspect, a reference to Hara Mavet, the title of the 1979 collection of poetry by Aaron Shabtai. And on this note of uh, traversing, and Denise, I'm uh, getting there, very close. Uh, on this note of uh, traversing the conventional language boundaries of Russian and Hebrew language Israeli verse, I'd like to move to the sixth segment, there are seven altogether, which is devoted to the poetic practices of Alexander Barash, who was born in Moscow in 1960, came to Israel in 1989, and who has really made a huge name for himself, not only as a poet, but, but as Yehuda Mikhail's principal. Russian translator. And the segment is called Alexander Barash in search of the Mediterranean note. I turn to the second section of uh, Barash's poem, Time of the Third Reigns, 
which on its surface is a fine example of Russian free verse endowed with subtle verbal orchestration and with a richness of Judaic spiritual and cultural references. Barash, so let's just read this section. Еще одно утро в квартире, висящей над Эйн Керемом в Палестине 2, времени года, дождливая осень и сухое лето, различаются три периода ранних дождей, первые дожди, вторые и третьи, сегодня десятое, кислево, время третьих дождей, скоро придется закрывать окна от западного ветра, включать камины и забиваться в аквариуме, авто, аквариумы автобусных остановок, как по соседству. Бараша's poetry, of course, invites a serious scrutiny of the notion of the Mediterranean note, which the critic Alexander Geistein advanced in the 1990s, and we'll hear about it soon from the next presenter, and which Barash embodies perhaps most fully. And it is perhaps fitting to end this brief inquiry with a discussion, perhaps an homage to a discussion of the short life of Anna Gorinka, who was born Anna Karpa in 1972 in Bindere, Moldova, Tigina, if you remember the Romanian title, and which is now oddly in the unrecognized uh, Pridnistrovian Republic, who made Aliyah in 1989 and who died of a drug overdose in Tel Aviv in 1999. So this is called Anna Gorenka Silan's Way. By the way, if we take seriously the pen name, it should be pronounced Gorenka, but I hear that uh, other people pronounce it Garenka, so I'm not prepared to debate it. I'm only saying that uh, the very act of adopting as her pen name, of Anna Akhmatova's birth name, Gorinka, could be conceived uh, of as a Jewish avant-garde gesture of defiance and of identity. Remake it. I would like to look very briefly, just to show you perhaps uh, a, a couple of my very favorite poems uh, by uh, Gorinka, both of which strike me as being in conversation with Paul Salon, whose birthplace, Chernovitz, like Gorinka's Bindere was under Romanian occupation during World War II and the Shoah. Like many of Salon's poems, Gorinka's poems enact a Jewish poet's agony over being verbally alive in a non-Jewish language in the post-Shoah period, in her case, writing in a slightly foreign Russian while living in Israel. And I'll just read uh, this section. Wake up, all the poets all died overnight in the hospital basement. They fill three big shelves. Some are swollen up horribly. Others have shriveled up. And one stinks so much, even the orderlies drop hints to each other about it. This last poem, which is called Translating from the European, has uh, uh, at the bottom of the poem in italics, the place, Theresienstadt, and the date, April 1943. Why Theresien? Why April 1943? Different possibilities come to mind. Perhaps this is because a transport of Jews from Westerbork arrived at Theresien in April 1943. Or is it perhaps a reference to the transport of children from the Bialystok ghetto that arrived in Theresien in August 1943? They would all perish in Auschwitz. There is in the last uh, quatrain a reference to Warsaw uh, as well. I think Gorinka's poems are laden with the verbal adoration of the imminence of death. I'm going to stop here, but before I do that, I just want to say that uh, uh, this is only a very, very partial list of names of Russian Israeli poets whom I have not been able to discuss today, names without whom a survey of avant-garde poetic practices in Israel would be forever incomplete. Saveri Greenberg, Vladimir Tarasov, Peter Ptach, Ari Rotman, Mikhail Karol, Evgeny Soshkin, Denis Sobolev, and Asia Engele. In closing, I cannot but make the necessary if obvious point, namely that Russian Israeli poetry today is a mirror of Russophone extraterritorial poetry, and uh, only the future will show which paths of the Russian avant garde this poetry will continue to follow in Israel. Thank you very much. <laughs>